So thank you for the opportunity to come back and be in front of you again. And uh, Sarah and Al, I, I just want to give you all another shout out. So let's, let's give them another round of applause. Uh, we heavily depend on their, uh, their cycle of news. I do early in the morning trying to get ready for the day and we just so much appreciate it. And uh, is Darcy Vetter still in the room? Is Darcy still in the room? You know, there she is. Darcy, uh, I, I'm gonna take this, the liberty here because there's everybody in here is connected to agriculture and there are millions of farmers across this country that so much appreciate all the hard work that you put into TPP while you was working for the previous administration. And I want to give this, this lady a round of applause that she deserves that she worked so hard to get us in that agreement. And you never know what some, all that hard work is going to uh, keep living and may surface up and, and we may really get some good stuff out of all that hard work you put into it anyway, Darcy. So we really appreciate that. You know, to reflect on uh, what we just heard, uh, I, and I was honored to be a part of it. I was among experts on the, on the panel here, you know, and I still picture myself just as an old farm boy uh, this, that God has uh, put on a mission here. and. And, uh, and I'm just privileged to be here, but Chuck, uh, one of the things Chuck said was that, you know, farmers only have really one business plan. Outside of our farms and how we deliver our products, really there's only one business plan because we have saturated the market here in America. And, and the future and that business plan for the future is to be able to sell overseas and that just uh, uh, announces how big trade is to us. And then Mitch talked about the quality of our products not just in milk, but all the products that we produce. And we have the quality and we have the infrastructure and we're the dependable customer of the world and that's got to be something really positive for us to use. Uh, the political shift, you know, the, the people out in the country where I come from, where my farm is, they wanna hear tough talk. That's what the president gave them in the election. They wanna hear that tough talk. Now they're nervous about it. They're real nervous about it. And, uh, but I think that's what's happening. But we got, that's why that consistent message to the Hill and to the administration about how important uh, trade is to agriculture, we got to make sure we n to get our lawmakers to understand we know how important it is and we can tough talk, have a, a stern backbone, uh, but still don't alienate those uh, personal relationships we have with these other countries so that we can continue to move forward. And then I thought Dor Darcy's point that, you know, uh, let's define what fair trade really is. Is it uh, selling just as many products as we import? Do we export just as many? What is the definition of what fair trade really is with this administration? And we'd be interested to know what that would be. And to also uh, talk about, let's, let's define, uh, we would like to see the, de the, de the administration define what was wrong with TPP. You know, what, is it outside agriculture? Where is it? And what can we do to uh, insert ourselves back into it? Um, and the question came up, where would we like to go to do new bilaterals? And, you know, uh, this is what we hear out of this administration that we're gonna have bilaterals. So we would love to know what countries, and I think uh, that our next speaker will have, give us the opportunity to have some insight in that. And I've heard him speak several times and, and I think he'll tell us that. So um, the gentleman I'm fixing to introduce to you that's gonna be our next speaker, um, he hears from us and focuses on trade and the impact of agriculture. He, he delivers that message and he delivers it well. Ted McKinney is the USDA Undersecretary for Trade and Foreign Agricultural Affairs. And I've heard him speak several times. He's a great speaker, uh, but you know, his background makes him the right person at the right time. Uh, Mr. McKinney um, was Secretary of Agriculture uh, in, in Indiana, uh, in a great farm state. So he was appointed or was worked with uh, Vice President Pence uh, there. Uh, he um, also uh, is the person that puts his heart and soul in his work. And I can see that by him. I describe his work and I ask him if my description was correct, is he's laying the groundwork 
for future trade agreements. And he's doing it on a, a time scale that's almost unbelievable. I don't know how his body's uh, absorbing all that travel. I do a lot of travel myself and it's not easy. So, uh, Mr. McKinney, we really appreciate, appreciate you doing that. Uh, he is um, prepared for this job by his past. He's worked in agribusiness. He grew up on a farm. Uh, Mr. Ted McKinney is doing a great job. I'm one of his biggest cheerleaders, and I think you'll enjoy listening to him. So give a, a very warm welcome to Under Secretary McKinney. Thank you, Zippy. One thing, I wanted to, one thing I wanted to say that I didn't get to say, you know, in agriculture, we've been fighting for this position for a long time. And Secretary Abdu, who is a friend of mine, I told him, I said, we've got to fill that position because trade's so important, and we've got to have a good man to do that. So to be the very first Undersecretary for Trade, that's a great honor for you, but it's a great privilege for us to have you here to talk to us today. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Zippy, you're a good man and a good friend, and uh, so is Farm Bureau, so thank you for all that you do and uh, that uh, is going on here. Well, first, let me say thank you to our hosts and hostesses. Um, every morning, I get up and I religiously, I may have missed one day on a travel, but I religiously read two newsletters. I start with AgriPulse, Sarah, I really do. And just because I'm still a Hoosier, I read Gary Truitt's Hoosier Ag Today just to see what's going back home so I can chastise my twin brother who's managing the family farm. And I don't know that I could start my day any better without those two, starting with AgriPulse. So thank you for what you all and your whole team does. What a team. I am unbelievable. So thank you all. Um, <clears throat> two or three key things I need to get out of the way here. Many of you are so very kind to call me Mr. Undersecretary, and I understand there's a formality that goes with that, but I have a twin brother that manages the farm. And when I go back to the farm, there's a pecking order, and I am somewhere below dirt. <laughs> if you ever wondered whether the government hack gets, you know, favoritism, the answer is not only no, but hell no. So I am Ted to all of you. I have been Ted to all of you for many years. I hope I'm still Ted to you. And if it's Mr. Undersecretary, don't say it around my twin brother because he'll throw up on both of us and you would not want that. So uh, I know my roots, I know my family, I know where I came from, and I know that I could just as soon be hauling manure somewhere or uh, something of the like versus doing this. Ray Starling. I met Ray Starling at a very momentous event, and I'm tying this to my, delighted, my delightful friends with uh, FFA. I had spent uh, more than little time trying aggressively and successfully in the end to recruit the National FFA Center to Indianapolis when they, not we, made the decision that Alexandria, Virginia was just a little too expensive and we landed it. And I met Ray when he showed up as a national FFA officer to do the groundbreaking. Now I'm not gonna date myself or Ray by telling when that might have been, but it was many years ago and it has, he has been a delightful friend ever since, and oh my gosh, what a teammate. And if you talk about team, and I heard this come up from several of you, for Greg Dowd to finally, finally be in place and be that great partner at USTR and Ray in the White House, and the list goes on, it is just a special, special time, and I'm grateful for those longtime friendships. Because you, you don't have to worry about getting to know somebody. You know them. You can get right to business, and you know that if you're going to be direct and candid, it's not taken with offense because you're longtime friends. And that's more important than you might even imagine. So I'm grateful to Ray and others. Well, Zippy, you said it. I, I, am, I want to thank all of those who wrote letters or in some way communicated about the need for this as a standalone position. I am very grateful. I don't know how my predecessors, like my good friend Darcy, or Michael Skews, who is a great friend. I don't know how they did it when an undersecretary had both domestic programs with all that goes with that, as well as trade and all that goes with that. And so I've read every letter, and there are many, many of your organizations out there, maybe some of you individually that wrote letters, and just know how grateful I am, and I can only hope that we are fulfilling all of your hopes and desires I feel we are. We are certainly more nimble 
as is evidenced by my trek toward that million miler club that the secretary reminds me about. And uh, so thank you because I hope we're honoring your wishes and I think now is, it may be past due, but certainly it is due given how much uh, churn there is on trade. So I hope we're, uh, we're meeting that need. Well, I'm going to talk about some things on trade, and I'm going to let Greg Dowd talk about some of the more current issues of steel, aluminum, and some of the more current trading partners. I'll reference that, but that's a USTR-led effort. I want to share with you some related but still important things. I want to share with you seven thoughts, lucky seven. The seven didn't just come by chance. We worked on that, but there are seven things I want to leave with you, and I'll try very hard to speak candidly because I don't know how else to be. The first one is something that has been revealed to me time and time again on many of these trips. It's something I bet some of us take for granted, or at least don't keep front of mind, but we can never forget it, and it's this simple. It does mean something. In fact, it means a lot that the quality of U.S. food and ag products and both the real and perceived safety, meaning the regulatory system and the fact that they are known to be safe, and in some countries, the volume of those products, it makes a difference. I've toured retail stores like Costco-like stores in Colombia, Brazil, and elsewhere. I've been to areas where Walmart now has a 60% market share, having purchased the supermarkets there. It is amazing to me, I, I, I've asked the question two or three times to make sure I'm hearing it correctly, that when they are able to brand U.S. products on their shelves, there's not a one, two, three, six-month run-up by consumers to buy those products. It's fairly immediate. So in these days of fretting about where we are or aren't on trade, for those of you that are in the food production and distribution business, I beg of you to never take for granted the quality of our products because it's real and I've asked the question not once, not twice, but six and seven times in different countries and it's real. That's point one. And I think it rightfully deserves its spot as point one. Secondly, it is probably time that the U.S. address these many unfair barriers. Now, I know the churn that goes with. I, too, have used the analogy that someone said about, Zippy said it, buckling up. And in the case of China, I'm suggesting shoulder straps with extra buckles. Okay? But what did we expect? I have been one of the voices when I was in the private sector complaining long and hard about unfair tar tariff barriers. In my company's history, in fact, one biotech trait I worked on in 2009 when I left Dow AgriSciences to go to Alanco is still languishing in China. There's no problems with that trait. It's a damn fine trait. So what did we expect? Did we think it was going to be a cakewalk to get where we needed to go in right-sizing all these many different things? Particularly when so many of them are the soft underbelly of sanitary, phytosanitary. Oh, we're not sure about the safety of this product. How do you disprove someone whose views are it's unsafe? Come on, folks, we've lived this in all of our businesses. I remember on the farm, I remember darn well when it kept raining in the spring and you wondered, are we going to get a crop in? Do we start switching from corn to soybeans? And oh, by the way, the moment you get in the field, you have a breakdown. And oh, by the way, the markets go down because the reports come out about a great crop somewhere else. We've all been through strife, trials, tribulations. Now, trust me, I'm not trying to equate the huge uncertainty of all that's going on with trade to something that happens on an individual farm or an individual business. But I am asking, I'm even begging you to draw a bit of an analogy because we have all been through this before. And I, for one, cannot have complained long and hard over those years about sanitary, phytosanitary, unfair trade barriers and then complain long and hard that what we're trying to do here is wrong. We can argue about the methods. 
We can argue about the rhetoric, the tone, but we cannot. We shall not, we must not argue whether it's the right thing to do. So it's the right thing to do, the how becomes where we have the discussions. And I think that came out very capably, but I wanted to really put a finer point on that. Because we can't complain then and then also complain now, at least too much. So the second thing is the U.S. is finally and definitively addressing trade barriers. And yes, buckle up. But you'll hear me end on point seven that I am bullish. You're asked to buckle up when there's turbulence on an airplane and you get to your destination just fine, 99.9% .9 of the time. You buckle up in your car seat. Most times it's by law and you usually get to your destination. We're gonna get to our destinations. It may take a little time in some cases, but we're gonna get to our destinations. So that's point two. Number three, which came up time and time again, and it's not lost upon me that the center of that word phrase had trade in about 1,000 point type and everything else was like 16 point type. I didn't know if that was a, a big circle on my chest or my back or what, but let me address it. I do not believe we have taken for granted these large markets that seem to be in discussions for some sort of a reset. I don't. I never did, I don't think you did, but by golly if we did, this is a reminder that we should never take for granted the countries where we do so much business. Canada, Mexico, Japan, China, Taiwan, and the list goes on. Let us never forget the importance of all our markets. But you know what? While my friends at USTR are taking the lead in all these new discussions, and we play our role. I got about two dozen folks at the Foreign Ag Service every day working on data analysis, policy analysis, and so if you wondered if there's good collaboration between USDA and USTR, I'll just tell you there's a couple dozen, and sometimes more, some days less, really working to make sure there's strong collaboration and that the truth is what is prevailing. But. There are markets. Let me give you an example. In fact, I'll give you several. It is not just by chance that our ag trade missions, starting two weeks after I was sworn in, are to markets that may not represent that 60, 80 percent. And the news is good. We went to India. Now let me start and end. I love my friends with India. I've told them that and we're going to go back and we're going to go back and it's going to be a bear to do business there. Tariffs, every time somebody squeals, a tariff goes up. I was rewarded a week after coming back, maybe two weeks after coming back with tariffs on peas, pulses and lentils from Roger Johnson's home state of North Dakota going straight up, including product which is on the water. Some of it only cleared three to four months later. It's going to be a bear. But guess what? Every journey of 10 miles or 100 miles or 1,000 miles begins with a single step and then another step. I'm a history buff. Let me take you back. How many of you remember watching TV when that miraculous Air Force One landed in, of all places, China? Nixon opened China. How much business were we doing with China then? Well, by the official record, zero. I have to believe some was coming through the back door in Hong Kong, but for, for the most part, it was nothing like we have now. And look where we are now. With all the issues that were fraught and going on with China, we're doing a lot of business with China. I happen to be a World War II buff. Look where our friends were in Japan, Germany, and many other countries. By their own fortitude, and I think some help by the Marshall Plan, look where Japan and Germany are today as trading partners. Every journey of 10, 100, 1,000, God, I hope it's not 10,000 miles, begins with a single step. And following that creed, that's why I said, after, even after what India did on the peas, pulses, and lentils, I said, we got to go back. We're going to sit down. We are going to sit down. We're going to work through this. Showing up is more than half the difference in winning the battle of trade. So we're going to show up. So to restate, Number three, there are markets. Let me move you to Guatemala. Got back two weeks ago, three weeks ago. 
and then went to Japan. So I knew Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador were a decent market. Let me give you some data. Second all-time high in the companies that went along to do business. And this is not just a show and tell and a follow up later. I mean, they're sitting down in a speed dating session three afternoons in a row doing business. It was so successful. And by the way, after it's over, my colleagues with Foreign Ag Service say, would you conservatively estimate what business you think is gonna come out of this? It was so strong, two, two companies were so through the stratosphere, we said, oh my God, this can't possibly be. So we set them aside to follow up and make sure, did they hear when we said conservative, really be realistic? Even after setting those two aside, it would represent the third all-time high ag trade mission. Guatemala, Honduras, and, and, and uh, El Salvador. There's business out there. There is business out there. Now, let's be honest. Sometimes I like my baseball example and sometimes I don't because I don't ever want to minimize any market. But I'll say it because you'll get it. I'll use baseball vernacular. Spring training is going on. we got baseball going on. If you equate our larger trading partners like the NAFTA countries and China, Japan, and others to a triple or a home run, we're going after doubles and singles. And by golly, we'll take a bunt or even a walk if it comes our way. And we all know that baseball games are won much more frequently on singles and doubles than they are triples and home runs. So we're flat getting after opening new markets. Now, Earl Butts was a good friend of our family. I knew Earl. I traveled with him when I was an undergrad at Purdue. And uh, would I have loved to come in this role and start talking about plant, fence row to fence row. The markets are so opportune. Green light all the way. All the things that Earl was so very, very good at saying. Yeah, that'd be great. But you know what? I think my time here is to do exactly what Zippy said, and that is to, to be a very good blockman with great mortar. We are building or rebuilding foundations. And if we do our job right, I hope we have some great victories to declare, and I think we will. I'll touch on a few in a moment. But I also hope we're laying a foundation so that any and all countries are in fact and in evidence free and fair trade. And oh, by the way, we expand to a whole lot more countries than the ones that people list off on five fingers. And there's evidence that we can do that and we are doing it. It takes some time. It takes some time. The relationships we've established in some of those countries is really strong. Really strong and getting better. And so back to a question that came to this panel, which by the way was one of the finest panels I think I've heard in a long time. Yeah, tone matters. So my style is I play pretty well in the sandbox. And I hope that they'll call me back another day. And they have been. And yes, you can work through problems diplomatically, respectfully, sometimes even with a smile on the face, and get somewhere. But it takes time. I could go on down the list, but we are flat out trying to lay new block with great mortar and build, or in some cases, rebuild our markets. That's point number three. Number four, and this is a little difficult for some. Last time I read the definition of trade, it suggests that it's a two-way street. So I'm very careful not to talk about trade in terms of exports. Now, I know who my paycheck is covered by. I know that exports are what help you all out. But we also are either faith-based enough or follow the golden rule enough to know that if it's a I win and you lose, that is not a very sustainable trade relationship. So we embrace discussing issues they have with trying to get their products in. And we're very clear, we know our scientific equivalency system. Make sure those mangoes are as safe as what we produce. Make sure whatever the product is, it's long and arduous, but you know, it is not an endless road. If you reach equivalency, we're an open country. And that's why trade barriers and the like for us is a little difficult. <clears throat> but the point is, 
Trade's a two-way street. I preach that. I talk that. We're going to live that. I lift those examples up when we open trade. Secretary is a symbol believer. Let me just tell you how strong I believe that. I think it was my third discussion with then Governor Purdue before his confirmation and, well, before I'd even selected. Um, we were talking, and, and he asked, well, what do you want to do? So I answered the question, and, and he followed up with two or three questions that sort of dealt with trade. And I said, well, well Governor, I don't ever want to be presumptuous. But if by chance you are looking at me for the trade role, you've got to know something about me. I said, I play fair in the sandbox. I believe in the golden rule. I'm faith-based. I believe trade's a two-way street. So you better tell me now if your view or others' view is I win, you lose, because I'm not destined to be part of your team then. He said, I am so glad to hear that because that's exactly how I feel. So I hope that we're living that. And it's not easy. It's not always so easy as to saying products that are off season in our time are the only products coming in. Sometimes it's the same product, but you know what? I'll compete on that with our food safety, our quality, and our trade uh, volumes any day of the week and twice on Sundays if I need to. So number four, trade is a two-way street. Number five, this is easy and you'll appreciate this, more than half the effort in winning the battle is just plain showing up. It's true. Not always, but oftentimes countries want to show that they're working on your issues. When you show up, they're ready to tell you that there's an announcement or that they've made progress on some sort of access. It's no different than you when you go to a friend's house. You want to greet them. You might take a bottle of wine. or It's the same thing. And that true is true here. And the same is true when they come to the U.S. We want to work toward building a relationship with them. We'll work with our friends at APHIS or MRP, you know, FSIS, to see how are we doing on the one or two or three key issues that are important to that country. Okay? So, more than half the battle, and that is where I am so grateful for that 2014 Farm Bill, the members of Congress, all of you wrote letters, that lets us be nimble so that we can get to all these countries that are so important, and they are. So five, more than half the way to winning the battle is simply showing up. Six, I got two more. This is delicate. I hope you'll keep headlines, rhetoric, even tweets and other things in perspective. Sometimes you have to push the boundaries a little bit more to even get partway to where you're going. And I believe the president is very serious about things he says. Sometimes isn't always literal about it, but always serious. So keep all that in perspective, whether it's headlines, worries, even joys, keep it in perspective because we all know the next day could be very different. And the same thing goes on in your business or your farm. You never know when that thunderstorm is going to come. We just lost a barn to sheer winds on my farm about two months ago. You never know when that sheer wind or that left hook or right hand or, or compliment, it's all the above. You don't know when it's going to come. So I know you've all had those experiences. So put what's going on with trade a little bit in the context of your own businesses. Now, I hope all your businesses are just hunky-dory, no road bumps, no need to buckle a seatbelt, but I think I know different. And so the fact that it's so many countries we're having these renegotiations on may leave you, including me, a little nervous. But I think we're going to get there. And I'll tell you this, the administration does absolutely know your views. If you ever wondered whether the map that saved NAFTA or the map that saved Korea exists, I'll tell you absolutely unequivocally, it does. I have seen it. The brilliant Dr. Jason Hoffemeister and the FAS team have showed it to me. Now, I don't know if it saved NAFTA and Chorus twice, but it certainly did once. And that kind of stuff is what we're doing 24-7, feeding that to the secretary primarily, but also our friends in the cabinet and anybody to listen. And I lovingly say that sometimes it's a gentle whisper and sometimes we turn that megaphone on high. And if you could put a turbocharger on that, I'd do that at times. But we're flat out getting the message across. But let's keep it in perspective because I think we're going to get there. Which leads me 
to number seven. I am bullish on the future. Now, I understand I'm a relatively positive oriented guy, but I hope I'm bullish, not Pollyannish. And you know the difference. Pollyannish is as wildly optimistic, perhaps improperly so. I am bullish. I believe we're going to get there on NAFTA, maybe even sooner than we think. I believe we'll get there on Korea. Right now, ag into Korea, ag in the U.S. say leave ag alone, so maybe that will prevail. I saw my good friends from Japan. I think one way or the other, we're gonna get there with, the, with, with agreement with Japan. And that'll be up to the president and USTR, what form that takes, whether it's the current mode of a bilateral or whether there is a default back to TPP. I do not know, I'm not gonna speculate on that. But let me tell you a story. I was in Japan two weeks ago. We concluded Friday evening when our U.S. ambassador to Japan, Bill Haggerty, great guy, had a wonderful reception in the ambassador's residence for history buffs. Ironically, it's the same one MacArthur lived in. So that was a real fix for me. And all the titans of Japanese industry were there. It was kind of Bill and me, maybe a few others from the embassy were the U.S. folks. And it was fun. I mean, no, it was not a love fest because there's issues we've got to deal with. But when the foreign minister went down the list of things that the new ambassador to the U.S. has to cover, it's a long list. But the fact that we were laughing about it and having fun with it says, all right, message to be sent here, message received. But it was warm. It was embracing. And I think it reflects that wonderful relationship we have with our friends with Japan, and we're going to get there. Now, once again, it's when, and I hope it's sooner than later because, you know, the TPP-11 has signed the agreement. Now, six of the 11 countries and their congresses have to sign off an agreement, and then I think we see some of the provisions of TPP in place. But I'm still bullish because if we get all this trade stuff right-sized, we are going to be far better off. We may not have 10 biotech traits languishing in China. We may not have things like class seven milk. And I could go down the list and I won't, but you all have experienced it full and for in your own industries. So I am bullish. So what's our strategy? No stone unturned. Been to Guatemala, been to India twice. Going to go to Indonesia later this year. I'll do a bilat with Vietnam and the Philippines at that time. We're going to go to China. Hope I'm allowed in. I think my team will. I don't know about me. Um, so no stone unturned. And, and we're going to South Africa. We're going to try African countries. We are working on building the foundation that Zippy so properly characterized for the future. And oh, by the way, with USTR's help, I think we have every opportunity to step back in. Well, we might have to put a Band-Aid on each other's arms, but I think we're going to be there with Canada and Mexico and all the other countries where we're doing redos. There are opportunities, and I'll leave it on this. We are building trust, or at least trying our darndest to do that. And that's where I'm so grateful to organizations like FFA and 4-H where you learn how to deal with adversity and strife. And you learn how to work with joys and celebrations too. But without those to help me and people like Ray guide themselves, it might be a little more difficult to figure out how to be honest, direct, truthful, but do so with a smile on the face. And that's what I'm trying to do is build that trust. And I am bullish and I hope you are as well. So, Sarah, I think we have some time for Q&A, but thank you all for the support you give to me, to Secretary Purdue, to the administration, and certainly all of agriculture. Love you all.